Okay. Okay. So, uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Dina Moyal, and I'm very happy to welcome you here for this special lecture uh, dedicated to the publication of Dr. Raz Segel's book, Genocide in the Carpathians, War, Social Breakdown, and Mass Violence, 1914-1945. And I'm really delighted to welcome today Dr. Raz Segel, who came here from Stockton University, New Jersey, and will be speaking about his book, and also our distin distinguished commentators, uh, Alon Confino, University of Virginia, and Ben Gurion, University of the Negev, and Stefan Ehring from the University of Haifa, all will be properly introduced uh, later on by Professor Javi Dreyfus of Tel Aviv University. So to me, uh, this event is special in several ways. So first, as a historian of Soviet Russia, uh, any event uh, for a book in Eastern Europe is, of course, a special, uh, a special occasion. But also, um, I think it's doubly rare to find young historians uh, dealing with such a specific area, the Carpathians, and examining the uniqueness of the events in this particular meeting point of cultures and ethnicities. Also, I think Ras Sega's book reminds us that context is decisive. No matter what models we bring forth, we need to situate events in the specific time, space, culture, practices, and languages. And this will help us describe and understand events in a fuller way. And finally, I think the, the third reason why I'm happy to be here is that I'm the coordinator of the work of the Inter-University Academic Partnership in Russian and East European Studies. And it's a par partnership that was established five years ago um, to enhance research and teaching and cooperation between five research universities here in Israel, uh, Ben Gurion University, Bar Ilan University, Haifa, Tel Aviv, and Hebrew University. And uh, thanks to all the hard work of our representatives in each of the universities, I think we have come a long way since uh, five years ago in developing this cooperation and supporting fellows, uh, classes, events. And uh, the way this ties up to Ras Segel is that last year, uh, Ras Segel was, uh, was a uh, fellow, postdoctoral fellow, selected by a committee out of 60 people. So I'm really happy that thanks to that year, uh, we have a book coming out and is, has a position in Stockton and will be speaking to us today. So welcome. Thank you. <coughs> So uh, we came here to hear uh, Dr. Raz Segel, and it's uh, actually it's uh, with great pleasure to introduce Raz. Although I must admit, it's also with some sadness as well, because as you just heard, Dina, uh, Raz today is not in one of the Israeli universities, at, at least now. But maybe things will change. But uh, uh, and this is why I'm introducing him also with some sadness. But what I can say is that this also makes this meeting even more important because many times here uh, Israeli scholars and Israeli students hear mainly themselves and there is like an internal discourse that that people hear more or same the same uh, uh, similar voices and Raz really brings a very different voice uh, with different thoughts and uh, I'm sure that it will be very interesting for, for everybody I can tell you that just before this meeting now we had part of a course dealing with uh, Jewish reaction during the Holocaust and though we were talking a little bit uh, about Jewish reactions or the Holocaust in Lithuania some of the questions which you imposed in your book and which of course uh, all read uh, for this meeting here already started to shape our thinking regarding some of the issues in Lithuania so we hope that this uh, impact will your impact will have an effect on other uh, fields and questions as well. Uh, um, Dr. Raz uh, Segal wrote his uh, doctorate under the supervision of uh, a few 
very well-known uh, um, scholars, uh, Professor uh, Dvorak Dvorak, uh, Anthony Polonsky and Yuda Bauer, and it dealt with genocide in the Carpatarus, war, social breakdown and mass violence, which you can see is one of the themes we will, which we will hear about. It wasn't, this is not his first book, and all of you who are writing MA thesis, and there are some advanced students here, uh, um, Raz's uh, first book uh, is actually a publication of his MA thesis, and it was published under the name Days of Rune, the Jews of uh, Munkach during the Holocaust. It was published in 2011, and I guess I won't take any more time from Raz, and uh, so he can represent uh, his book and other things that he's doing today. So please, Raz, thank you very much. Uh, it's okay. Thank you for everyone for coming. Um, to say that I'm really uh, um, excited and um, anxious a bit <laughs> from the uh, from this event, and um, uh, I really I want to you know start by thanking. Uh, um, I have many people to thank, but I'll, I, I want to thank people who are here. Rafi Vago, Professor Rafi Vago, who, with whom I, you know, in a way began uh, this uh, path uh, with this MA thesis on uh, uh, Munkach, and many of my initial conversations and thoughts crystallized in uh, Rafi's uh, small office uh, uh, downstairs. Uh, uh, of course, for the two uh, scholars who agreed to respond today, uh, Alon, and Stefan, um, thank you very much. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge honor that uh, uh, scholars like you agree to read and comment my work and talk about it in this kind of an event, uh, which makes me even more anxious and uh, <laughs> and excited. Um, my parents are uh, came uh, today, um, and uh, um, it's very important as well, of course. Um, my partner, Anat. <laughs> Um, and I was, as uh, Dina said, and thank you for the introductions, a fellow uh, here at Tel Aviv University last year, um, uh, and many more deaths. But I'll, uh, and of course, thank you for, for to you, Scott, for organizing this event and for offering, I I and for Eitan, um, um, and offering me last year also a place to sit and uh, work and talk and think and uh, engage. Um, so let's uh, let's begin. Um, okay, um, just just how do I oper operate this once I need it? How do I operate this? Just with the with the mouse. Okay. Okay. <coughs> it's a strange time to be a scholar dealing with the Holocaust and genocide. Everyone can hear me. Yeah. Uh, we live in a world of global. Holocaust memory, full of university programs, museums, NGOs, memorial days, and monuments about the Holocaust. Leaders in the post-World War II and post-Holocaust world claimed to adhere to values of democracy and peace, human rights, and the prevention of genocide. Yet these claims have remained largely empty. And today, <clears throat> leaders have even stopped talking the talks. The masks have fallen. Aung San Suu Kyi, a woman who holds a Nobel Peace Prize, stands at the head of Burma, a country where the Muslim Rohingya group faced an extremely violent assault by the state, possibly genocidal. Donald Trump won an election in the US while talking explicitly about the deportations of millions. And 65 million refugees around the world, not including internally displaced people, make a mockery of any discourse about human rights. <clears throat> I wonder, might the international educational, academic and political discourses about the Holocaust account somehow for how the world around us looks? At least in one way, the answer I think is yes. We have, and we still do, treat the Holocaust, wow, we have and still do treat the Holocaust as a category of its own. And so we detach it not only from the world in which it happened, 
but also from the world around us, which is not that different. The Holocaust happened in the heart of Europe in the middle of the 20th century, not by any accident. It unfolded as an integral part of the late modern world, and we still inhabit this world. A world of nation states, citizens, and refugees. A world of minorities who are constantly vulnerable to states claimed by majorities. A world which seeks strong leaders to pursue strong policies. From the US to Russia, from Hungary to India, and most places in between. The Holocaust, in other words, is still a set of events and processes very much in need, as Dina emphasized, of contextualization. This is quite basic in historical research, but is considered somewhat radical when the Holocaust and Jews are involved. This is what my book and my, my work does, places one subset of this set of events and processes in context. Let me show you why I think this is important. But first, a few words about the subset in question, the Carpathian region. Um, no? Try the arrows. The arrows? Arrows? No. So, uh, okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the Carpathian region, uh, right here, just some points of reference, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, Romania. Um, it's right here. Uh, before World War I, it was uh, in the Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, very briefly after World War I, it became part of the new state of Czechoslovakia. Uh, in two stages, uh, in late 38 and 39, it was <coughs> occupied by Hungary. In October 1944, the Soviet <coughs> army uh, arrives and it uh, uh, turns within a year into a part of Soviet Ukraine. And after 1989, it became, as it is still now, part of independent uh, Ukraine. So a typical, in this uh, case, uh, Eastern European region with many, many border shifts. In the 1930s, uh, uh, we're talking about a population of about 700,000 uh, uh, people, 450,000 Carpathian Athenians, which is an East uh, Slavic uh, group, about 100,000 Jews, 120,000 ethnic uh, Hungarians, 15,000 uh, local ethnic Germans and small numbers of Romanians uh, here, some Slovaks uh, here, and in the interwar period also Czech administrators uh, from uh, Prague. Um, so this, this should just give us uh, uh, a bit of a picture on the history and demographics of the region. Um, so. We say the Holocaust in Hungary, the Holocaust in Hungary, but what is usually meant by that? The rapid ghettoization and deportations to Auschwitz of around 440,000 Jews, including a bit less than 100,000 from the Carpathian region, in the spring and early summer of 1944, after the German invasion of Hungary in March 1944. Now this is of course true. And it also includes the building blocks of how we understand the Holocaust more generally. Nazi Germany, Jews, and in this case also the central symbol of evil since 1945, Auschwitz. But it is only part of the story, and actually a rather decontextualized part, as it blurs the simple fact that it happened in Hungary during World War II. And we need, therefore, to understand it as an integral part of the history of Hungary during the war, which is itself an integral part of the modern history of Hungary. 
The concept itself, the Holocaust, a foundational concept to use your formulation alone, here works to create a historically disembedded description and explanation of the discrimination, persecution, mass violence, mass deportations, and mass murder of around half a million Jews. And it does so by depicting Hungary and Hungarian authorities with another term, a central term in Holocaust scholarship, collaboration. This, however, was not a case of collaboration, but rather one extremely violent part of Hungarian policy during the war against Jews and other groups, with the aim of transforming the borderlands that Hungary occupied during the war into a part of an ethno-national Greater Hungary. Let me just uh, a few points of explanation here. So, as we said in red, this is Hungary in the Austro-Hungarian Empire before World War I, which was a very, especially in its border territories, a very multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multilingual state. After World War I, this is what remained of Hungary. It came out on the defeated side. And with the Trianon Treaty in 1920, it lost uh, all its borderlands. Um, revision, territorial revision, became a central element in Hungarian politics and society, uniting everyone left and right, Jews, non-Jews, everyone adhered to territorial revisionism. And the political elite in the 1920s and 30s aimed to reestablish or to establish a new Greater Hungary, but one now uh, uh, based on ethno-nationalism and ethno-national Greater Hungary. So reoccupying the, t the border territories, the Carpathian region, Transylvania, and the uh, uh, southern territories, the Delvidek, um, and basically destroying these societies in order to turn them in, in, into integral part of an ethno-national Greater Hungary. So, what happened in the Carpathian region then was a state assault against a society as a whole. The goal was to destroy diversity as an organizing idea of society and as lived reality. This is the reason that I argue that the Carpathian region and other borderland areas offer us an opportunity to reimagine the lives of Jews as integral to the societies in which they had once lived for generations, as the violence of the greater Hungary idea sought to destroy ultimately even the ability to imagine this. Let us see briefly, with a bit more detail, what that meant, even before the beginning of World War II and well before the German invasion of Hungary. So the first, uh, uh, the first, uh, case that I'll just made, mention uh, very briefly in the violence of the Greater Hungary idea in the Carpathian region is right at the beginning when Hungary starts <coughs> to expand in the late 30s and to reoccupy part of these borderlands. Uh, in March 1939, Hungary joins Nazi Germany's destruction of Czechoslovakia. The German army rolls into Prague. The Hungarian army rolls into the Carpathian region. And there is a small resistance in the Carpathian region by a local Carpathian Ruthenian militia. The Hungarian put down the resistance very quickly within days, but following this uh, 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 putting down the resistance, there are, there's about a week of uh, uh, small scale massacres against Carpathian Ruthenians, both militiamen and uh, people who were not uh, in the militia. And we're talking about between three and 5,000 people murdered, in some cases, in organized massacres by the Hungarian army. Uh, we'll come back to this in a few minutes because one of the interesting things is that Jews witness these massacres and they talk about them in their testimonies. So we'll come back to this uh, um, in a few minutes. Uh, but the, the, the violence of the Greater Hungary idea begins not with Jews, but with uh, uh, Carpathian Ruthenians in March uh, 1939. Uh, yes. Um, jumping now to summer 1941, Nazi Germany invades the Soviet Union in June. Hungary 
joins the, the German assault on uh, the Soviet Union and takes advantage that the Hungarian army controls a small strip of land north of the Carpathians in East Galicia uh, in order to pursue a large scale mass deportation, mass deportation scheme. Um, and this is the way that the Hungarian governor of the region, Miklos Kozma, uh, talks about uh, uh, these planned deportations a few days before they actually begin in July 1941, as he writes to a, his good and very trusted friend, the Hungarian Prime Minister Laszlo Baudosi. He says, at the beginning of next week, I will push all the non-Hungarian Galicians who escaped here, the uncovered Ukrainian agitators and gypsies across the border. Um, this is a very revealing document uh, uh, because the uh, governor here and the Hungarian uh, authorities are making an explicit link between the different groups in the region, right, to pursue uh, a policy, as I explained, of destroying the social fabric of the region as a whole, right? And the rationals for persecution are also very much important here. Gypsies appear without any kind of, they're explicit in the document, there's no description, it's clear that gypsies, they're wandering around, they don't belong essentially, right, they're dangerous, that requires no explanation in the document. Uncovered Ukrainian agitators refers to the violence of March 39. Carpathian Ruthenians, mostly those identified with Ukrainian nationalism, some of them also identified with communist activities. They're perceived as dangerous, as a security threat, as in March 1939, and they, they're also in the documents. And non Hungarian Galicians is Jews, and this refers to. This is the idea, and this is true, that many Jews came to the region in the end of the 19th century, early 20th century from East Galicia. But the meaning of non-Hungarian Galicians here is Jews who, can't, who are not Hungarians, who do not have Hungarian citizenship, right? Who again, this is about belonging, this is about people who do not belong here, who, sh who are not Hungarians, who are not part of what should be a greater Hungary, okay? Um, we also see as the, uh, uh, in the 16th of July, as the deportations uh, uh, happen, uh, that it's clear that Jews are being deported, but also that uh, uh, gypsies are being deported. Again, wandering gypsies. Uh, there's, actually, there's also documents that the Hungarian authorities in other occasions talk about wandering gypsies and wandering Jews together. So again, highlighting how the the authorities, uh, uh, again, aim at the region as a whole, not only, it's not only about Jews or about gypsies or about Carpathian Ruthenians, uh, and highlighting this issue of wandering, of belonging, of security threats, right? There is a, a, a complex picture here of the rationale of persecution. So, in this case of, of uh, mass deportations, uh, the Hungarian authorities deported about 20,000 Jews from the Carpathian region. There were also deportations from other parts of the country, including from Budapest, but most of the victims were from the Carpathian region, about 20,000. Uh, in some cases, whole, com whole Jewish communities were destroyed in summer 1941 by the Hungarian authorities, so we're talking about uh, a case of mass violence which assumed genocidal uh, uh, dimensions clearly well before the German uh, invasion in March 1944. And it's important also that the deportation stopped in the 15th of August, right, because the German authorities on the other side of the Carpathians, who were then in full swing in the first stages of their invasion of the Soviet Union, stopped them. The, Germans, the German authorities stopped these deportations, right, and we actually have uh, the whole correspondence in the archives of Miklos Kozma with the German authorities trying to convince them to continue the deportations to no avail. They, uh, uh, they wouldn't hear uh, of it. Um, and uh, the German authorities stopped the deportations 
mostly because they're now at this stage interested in the mass in a very limited gendered genocide male Jewish male of military age at this stage right it starts to change in August but it's Jewish male of military age and they're not interested in more Jews in the rear army areas right this is a security issue for the Germans they perceive Jews as part of the Soviet state right they don't want more Jews they stop the deportations um, and we have a clear conflict here between the Hungarian authorities and the German authorities which again underlines how this is a Hungarian project right which actually came into conflict with the German agenda at this stage another thing that's very clear from this document is another I would say foundational concept in Holocaust scholarship anti-semitism uh, which is uh, which we usually use uh, as if everyone knows what we're talking about but actually uh, it's not always clear what we're talking about and today we use anti-semitism to describe things that happened from ancient Egypt until criticism of the state of Israel it's all under anti-semitism and a term like this that explains so much and so broadly it many times ends up explaining very little and sometimes nothing at all here we see the importance of thinking about what is actually anti-semitism what is the content right of the anti-Jewish positions uh, uh, actions, policies, violence, right? We need to think about the rationals for persecution as the Hungarian authorities uh, uh, saw them. And in this case, it's about looking at links rather than comparisons. We're very much used to thinking about Jews and particularly about the Holocaust in a comparative framework, right? Jews compared to others, the Holocaust compared to other genocides or to other cases of mass violence. Here, we can have the comparative framework, but what I would like to highlight is the connective framework. How what happened to Jews is linked to what happened to other groups. It may be different, it may be whatever you want to say, but it's definitely connected. I'm interested in, the, in these links. What do they tell us about what happened to Jews? Um, and of course, I think that in this way, anti-Semitism, rather than offer kind of a preconceived set of answers or ideas opens up some questions, right? And offers some, at least raises some questions for further uh, research. Um, very briefly before I, I turn, uh, I'll talk for about six or seven more minutes, okay? Um, uh, very briefly before I turn to the last part, uh, after the deportations ended in August, there was uh, de-escalation of violence of the Hungarian state but still with a continued assault on the region through discrimination, political violence against those suspected as communists or Ukrainian nationalists, daily harassment, violence and arrests, forced labor and robbery again aimed against Jews, Carpathian Ruthenians and according to Soviet, Soviet documents about 90,000 Carpathian Ruthenians were arrested, deported, tortured um, uh, and of course uh, Roma which faced probably the most extreme daily violence in the region at the time and then we have indeed the German invasion and unlike in the summer of 1941 here the agenda of the Hungarian authorities which we might uh, uh, call uh, uh, just for uh, simplifying uh, it ethnic cleansing here ethnic cleansing coincided successfully with the Nazi uh, uh, agenda of genocide but again this was in the Hungarian view not only uh, about Jews and it was not about mass murder in Auschwitz this was the German this is again the German element of the story for the Hungarians it was destroying a social fabric right about uh, removing people from one place to another right um, and it was aimed also after the after the de mass deportations of Jews in spring and early summer the Hungarian authorities turned uh, to a uh, uh, concerted assault against the Roma populations which again is about uh, they actually drop lists we have lists the Roma lists there's arrests there's deportations um, and of course we need to remember something that we all everyone who deals with the Holocaust in Hungary knows but it's always important to re-emphasize <coughs> Adolf Eichmann arrives with the Hungarian army, uh, with the German army in Budapest in March 1944 with uh, his Sondereinsatz with 200 people. That includes the secretaries, that includes the drivers, that includes everyone, right? In the Carpathian re region, Franz Novak and Dietl Wisitseni, Eichmann's men, operate with 40 SS men, okay? There is no 
case of mass violence in human history where 40 people deport 100,000 people. It just doesn't happen, right? This was a Hungarian project planned by the Hungarian authorities, envisioned by the Hungarian authorities, implemented by the Hungarian authorities according to Hungarian interests and designs, and rooted in the modern history of Hungary and the greater Hungary idea. The Holocaust then treats Jews, the concept the Holocaust, treats Jews across contexts rather than in local, regional, and state contexts of genocide and mass violence. And just to, to uh, visualize this, we, we say the Holocaust partly because we, we understand that there's something that connects what happens to a Jew in the Carpathian region, a Jew in Amsterdam, and a Jew in Vilna, right? And this is true. But another part of the story, right, is that what happens to a Jew in the Carpathian region is related to what happens to a Roma in the Carpathian region and to a Carpathian Ruthenian in the Carpathian region. And what happens to a Jew in Kiev is also related to what happens to the Ukrainian population in Kiev and around Kiev and so on and so forth, right? So in context rather than across context. This reflects the view of the history of Jews as separate, a view that seems obvious in our world of nation states, though it is quite simply wrong. My final remarks in the next few minutes shift to the social sphere, the focus of my current research project, to show what we miss when we treat Jews as separate and continue to use the decontextualized frame created by the term the Holocaust and the key concepts that come with it. And here I'm returning now to, the, uh, to 1930, March 1939, to these uh, small-scale massacres uh, of Carpathian Ruthenians by the Hungarian uh, army. Jews witnessed Hungarian soldiers killing Carpathian Ruthenians. Uh, Rabbi Yashua uh, Greenveld of Hust, a small town in the eastern part of the region, wrote shortly after the war that Hungarian soldiers killed numerous Carpathian Ruthenians. And here we have two quotes uh, from two different uh, places in the region. Our own Rat uh, talks about the incarcera incarceration of the, these local militiamen, and we're talking about very uh, young Carpathian Ruthenians. These are teenagers, essentially, in a school in his small town, uh, Velki Biechkov. Um, and he says every night for several days they would take some of them out and kill them in the forest. So, systematic uh, massacre for a few days in this town. Um, and Eva Shlomovitz, uh, from another small town, uh, has a very revealing uh, description of this uh, case in her uh, um, small village, really. She says, they killed them. The Hungarians killed these young boys, a lot of them. And I want to uh, uh, talk a bit about Eva Shlomovitz's description because it's particularly revealing. She repeats her statement about the killings three times, one after the other, each with a bit more information the identity of the perpetrators, the youth of the victims, and the scale of the attack. It is as if she wished to disrupt her flow of words, perhaps to remain with the anonymity of the first part of the sentence, they killed them. But I suggest that some degree of disbelief, even as she recounted this episode after many years, this is a, both of them are testimonies from the Shah Foundation, the uh, Spielberg uh, project, some degree of disbelief pushed her to restate the mass killing, unprecedented in her life until then. This was something completely new for her, right? That she had witnessed in her hometown. Now, it was Saul Friedlander, eminent historian of the Holocaust, who evoked the disbelief of Jews as victims in the face of persecution and mass murder during the Holocaust. They could not fathom the abyss that many of them felt had suddenly opened to devour their worlds. Seeking to place this acute alienation at the center of his narrative, Friedlander asked his readers to retain a sense of disbelief, quote unquote, a sense of disbelief with regard to the ways in which this case of genocide happened. That is, to mistrust any explanation in order to remain on the pre-knowledge level of experience, where, to quote Friedlander, disbelief is a quasi visceral reaction, one that occurs before knowledge rushes in <clears throat> before knowledge rushes in to smother it. Now, a critical engagement with, with this somewhat religious proposition extends beyond the confines of this paper. What is important, however, is to stress here that Eva Shlomovitz's disbelief relates to the position not of the victim, but of the bystander, exact, actually. 
So Eva Shlomovitz here is describing herself as a bystander. She's not using the term, of course, but this is what she's describing. Her disbelief stemmed from the violence she had seen, no doubt, but also, I argue, as a response to its broader meaning, the rupture of her familiar, familiar world, a clearly ominous indicator that life could never return to normal. If, to paraphrase her, they could kill them. And if they, the Hungarian occupiers, could kill them, the Carpathian Athenian neighbors of Jews, so the attack destroyed not only them, but also the whole set of daily interactions that defined normality. In short, it laid a blow on a way of life of both Carpathian Athenian victims, and in this case, Jewish bystanders. To conclude, if we think about Carpathian Ruthenian bystanders in 1944 in the ghettoizations and deportations after the German invasion, without placing them within the appropriate historical process from the 1920s and 30s actually and into the war period, we risk falling into the regrettably still common accusatory and moralizing tone concerning bystanders in Holocaust scholarship. This tendency to judge how could they be a bystander, right? How could they see this? How could they uh, look at the destruction of their neighbors, right? So this tendency to judge rather than understand brushes aside complexities by viewing history backwards from 1944 in our example, <coughs> rather than as it unfolded from 1939, and by imposing on it a Western liberal notion of choice and agency that in no way fits the perceptions of most European at the time, Jews and others, that their societies and worlds had been irrevocably shattered and that their lives and the places where they lived had changed drastically and forever. It is precisely this largely successful obliteration of the society and shared culture of the pre-World War II Carpathian region, region that renders the narrow focus on Jews and the use of such general and disembedded concepts as bystanders analytically obstructive. It is, to put it simply, high time that we treat the genocide of Jews during World War II, or rather the various genocides of Jews across Europe at the time, as an integral part of the history of modern Europe. Thank you.